Okay. And hopefully everybody can see all this right now. Is there any problems in visualizing the PowerPoint? Okay, I'll take that as an okay to go. Okay, so my uh, uh, like my discussion is going to be on a look into exercise and nutrition in the prevention and management of disease. I'm going to look at it from an integrative and physiological approach. And I always like to kind of start things off with a picture of myself when I've ever had to do any type of uh, presentation uh, in an online manner. Uh, when I've uh, participated in these as a student, um, I've always wondered what the individual who is presenting the information looks like. So uh, here's a picture of myself. And once again, I'm an assistant professor at Concordia University of St. Paul in the Department of Kinesiology and Health Sciences. Okay, so when we look at uh, the outline of today's uh, talk, um, first off, I want to establish what is exercise science um, and what it means to me, what it means to students. Uh, from there, uh, where are the jobs in the field? I think whoever, if you're looking to get a bachelor's degree in exercise science or a master's degree or even a terminal degree, um, students always wonder, where are the jobs at? Am I going to have a job when I graduate? And we'll look at prospective job uh, opportunities as it pertains to uh, the year 2018 and some related salaries and uh, related to these exercise science jobs. And then will my education put me in the best position to get a job? Uh, and the one we're going to really look at um, as an example of a uh, position in uh, the field related to exercise science as a research scientist in clinical exercise physiology. And specifically, that kind of ties into my uh, major topic of today's uh, webinar is a look into exercise and nutrition in the prevention and management of disease. Uh, we'll look at it uh, with the vantage point of uh, peripheral artery disease, a form of uh, cardiovascular disease. And then, uh, we'll also kind of finish with a look at the curriculum at Concordia St. Paul uh, from a bachelor's of arts standpoint all the way into the master of science program and to see what our current students are really working on that kind of tie into uh, the realm of clinical exercise physiology because I think that is where exercise science jobs are going to really be heading uh, in the near future as we all are all aware about. Uh, the problems associated with poor diet and physical inactivity leading to obesity, metabolic diseases, and cardiovascular diseases. So what is exercise science really? Now, a picture, as you guys can see here, is uh, somebody doing an exercise stress test hooked up to a 12-lead ECG. And to me, exercise science is a look at the acute and chronic effects of not only exercise, but habitual physical activity and how that affects the physiological machine that we call humans. Um, we can look at exercise science in terms of the physical, uh, maybe a physics, physics standpoint, uh, also known as the biomechanics. Uh, could look at the uh, physiology and biochemistry as the picture here kind of shows. The electrocardiography is looking at the um, electrical activity of the heart and how that controls the pumping capacity and how we are able to uh, readily distribute oxygen, oxygen to all of our metabolically active muscles. And we can also look at it from a psychological standpoint, a uh, exercise science that uh, works more in um, the psychology of exercise, maybe more interested in what are the uh, psychological adaptations to chronic exercise? We know that exercise is a potent uh, wave of, uh, say, uh, psychologists or um, any type of therapist uh, to help combat uh, psychological uh, disorders or difficulties such as uh, related to stress management, maybe ADHD, um, and uh, psychological diseases of that nature. So we at uh, Concordia University, we look at it uh, in terms of exercise science as being under the umbrella of kinesiology and health, health sciences. Kinesiology is just the basic study of movement, also known as human kinetics. Now, uh, we can look at it in, uh, in terms of exercise science. Uh, we look at it from more of a physiological type of vantage point that can uh, relate to health. Um, improve quality of life, 
or improved athletic performance. So a lot of students come in uh, that I've worked with in the past and say it was during the uh, Summer Olympics and Usain Bolt just ran a 9.6 uh, 9 second 100 yard dash. Now you look at him uh, as being a tall lanky sprinter and all the other uh, Olympic athletes in the other seven lanes are kind of shorter um, more stocky, big legs, uh, and you look at him, he just stands out. How is somebody that with that body frame able to run that fast in a uh, various uh, kind of sprinting um, high power output event? It just doesn't make sense, uh, we'll say biologically. So an exercise scientist is concerned with, well, why? How does that work? How does he fit outside the mold and still produce the fastest 100 meter uh, run in uh, history? Before that, it could have been uh, for performance, uh, Roger Bannister breaking the four, four, minute, mi four minute mile. Uh, how is that physiologically possible? What are uh, the series of events um, biochemically or physiologically that allow for uh, him to generate that much aerobic power and to break the four minute mile. Now me, I've always looked at it more from a clinical exercise physiology vantage point, can be the fact that uh, exercise therapy um, for cancer patients, a lot of cancer patients are exposed to chemotherapy before uh, tumor removal. Uh, cancer therapy such as uh, chemotherapy can really diminish somebody's uh, oxygen uh, carrying capacity and uh, aerobic power, and that's one of the biggest predictors of mortality. What would happen if we incorporate an aerobic exercise training uh, program uh, within, between that six-week window between the uh, finishing of chemotherapy to the uh, time, the say, the uh, shrunken tumor has been removed? Are we going to improve quality of life by doing that? That's going to be very important into a lot of these individuals that are suffering from cancer. Okay, so that's kind of in terms of exercise science, some of the questions that we may come across and may be asking ourselves when we're in the field or in the classroom. Now, another uh, definition of exercise science is the science and study of the acute and, uh, responses and, uh, and adaptations to a wide range of physical exercise conditions, looking at uh, physiology and applied physiology, applied physiology. We have biomechanics, the motor learning and development, and then in some aspects, uh, the psychological vantage points of exercise science. So what can we do with exercise science degrees? Now, the first thing I would like to point out before we um, look at some of the um, individual jobs, uh, the asterisk, uh, one asterisk uh, requires a terminal degree. We may have uh, two asterisks that look at a specific type of license that's going to be required, or three asterisks you may need to take a certification test, but a lot of times that's what um, the degree is going to help prep you for as well. So in terms of physiology, I've had a lot, uh, several students that, as I went through the ranks as a student um, and was in graduate school getting my master's degree, that instead of going on to get, say, a PhD, they got went into medical school. A lot of, um, say, medical schools are, they do like uh, individuals that um, have an exercise background, exercise and nutrition background, and the exercise science degrees often have uh, biology, chemistry, biochemistry, and physics, uh, um, we'll say, requirements for graduation, same as for applications to these advanced schooling. Now, why do they like that? We know how unhealthy individuals are right now, and if we look at uh, medicine in a preventive approach, we're going to see less and less people having to go to the doctor for treatment, okay? So if we have that underlying uh, knowledge of exercise and nutrition being a form of medicine, uh, we're going to see a, a movement um, of individuals that are going to be maybe prescribed exercise and nutrition uh, in order to help prevent disease and keep insurance costs and medical costs down. Uh, we can look at it in, in terms of rehabilitation, uh, physical therapy, occupational therapy, and cardiac rehabilitation. Cardiac rehabilitation is an up-and-coming job just because cardiovascular disease is the number one killing 
or cause of death in America's and that's listed by the Centers uh, for Disease Control and Prevention. Um, cardiac rehabilitation, oftentimes they want you to have a master's degree in exercise science and then you would take a certification test, uh, most notably uh, by the American College of Sports Medicine and then appropriate, uh, we'll say ACLS, uh, Advanced Cardiac Life Support uh, certification as well. Um, what else can you do? Biomechanics, uh, you, you hear oftentimes about independent coaches. Uh, or quarterback coaches that help with uh, throwing mechanics. Uh, they're going to have a major background in biomechanics and the motor learning and development. Uh, PE, if you're looking to get a job in physical education, exercise science is another area that you'd want to get into. Um, however, you're going to have to take a, a licensing type of degree when you're done or uh, be part of a accredited school. Then I also have listed as general. You have the strength and conditioning coaches often requiring a certification as a certified strength and conditioning coach as uh, recommended by the National Strength and Conditioning Association. Uh, a personal trainer, um, those are going to require some type of certification. Uh, a lot of times if you're working in the field of personal training and you are uh, paid by commission, uh, the more education you have and the more certifications you have, the greater amount of uh, the take home you actually get um, from the client. And also athletic trainers, researchers, and fitness coach and professionals, just to name a few. Okay, and with the exercise science jobs, um, we can see that uh, the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics, and this was just published uh, uh, last month, and they listed the fastest growing jobs by 2018, and we can see that uh, there are six of them uh, that are related to the field of exercise science. Now, uh, number 30 was a fitness professional. This incorporates uh, personal trainers, group, uh, uh, group exercise uh, classes, um, 29 was occupational therapy, um, and you have to take a board exam after you finish, but a lot of occupational therapists will have an undergraduate degree in exercise physiology or a concurrent uh, master's degree in ex uh, related to exercise science. Um, number 26 kind of goes hand in hand with the occupational therapist that is a uh, physical therapist. And then as we move down, athletic trainers being number 10. Uh, physician's assistant is up and coming uh, as number seven, um, particularly as we know the trend of today's society being uh, eating poorly and being inactive. Uh, we're going to be relying more on Western medicine uh, for therapy, and that's the role of the physician assistant as well. And last on the list at number six is a research scientist in clinical exercise physiology, um, oftentimes requires a master of science degree a minimum or a PhD in the field. Uh, and this is what I'm going to be kind of uh, turning this presentation into is this is what I did when I was pursuing my PhD and still do research, um, considered a research scientist, uh, actively uh, investigating the anti-inflammatory effects of exercise. So the growing kind of, uh, we'll say trend in the field of exercise physiology or exercise science is was developed in and we'll say 2007 2008 by the American College of Sports Medicine uh the major governing agency of exercise of physiology and this is exercise is medicine now we know that the healthcare industry is growing people are uh you know uh we're decreasing our health um because of poor lifestyle habits now, is this going to affect the exercise professional? And I definitely think this is indeed the case. Uh, if you look at the trend in jobs, as we talked about on the last slide, um, we're looking for newer therapies, particularly in uh, terms of preventive medicine, looking at exercise and nutrition uh, to help lower uh, the amount of people having to go to the uh, doctor or uh, potentially can lower uh, health care costs. Now, uh, if you look at the exercise science or exercise scientists, they're going to require a broader scope of practice with evolving competencies. So um, if you have a bachelor's degree and you're graduating with an exercise science degree, uh, you know, it may not just be 
uh, enough to really focus yourself on, say, athletic performance, um, particularly if you're looking to get a job related to clinical exercise physiology. Um, I'm not trying to steer anybody away from uh, applied exercise science looking to improve uh, peak performance in athletes, but I think people there's going to be more mo time and money put into general health and the role of exercise um, that's going to be at the forefront of prevention and treatment of disease. So I put this slide in here uh, in the picture because this is, I've always joked with the physiology students that I teach, um, this, is, this is an attention getter. Now looking at medical research in the field of exercise physiology, um, this is a picture of a foot that uh, we'll see an individual that I worked with in the research setting that was qualifying for a study to look at the exercise intervention or exercise intervention for the treatment of peripheral artery disease. Um, unfortunately, this guy's disease was very severe and he didn't qualify and immediately when he came into our laboratory, actually we had to kind of ship him off to the hospital because as you can see here, he was at a major risk for getting not only his toes, but his foot being amputated. And this is because of inadequate blood flow to the foot, causing gangrenous necrotic tissue. Now, if we look at the prevalence of atherosclerotic diseases in the United States, um, coronary artery disease, the prevalence is 13.2 million people. Another name for coronary artery disease is uh, coronary heart disease, so same thing. But that is a large number of individuals that have uh, some type of blockage uh, or atherosclerosis uh, within their coronary arteries. And that is a major uh, disease that is the number one cause of death in the United States that is, in gen that is generally uh, to some degree preventable. If you look at other forms of atherosclerotic diseases, uh, cerebral vascular disease that increases your risk for a stroke, so a blockage in the carotid artery is the most common cause. Um, that's about 4.8 million people suffer from this, and that's about a 70% um, occlusion of the carotid artery that would have to qualify for that. So pretty severe narrowing of the carotid artery that uh, increases your risk for a stroke. And then the one that you just saw a picture of, peripheral artery disease, has 8 to 12 million people. And there's quite a few, um, as we'll get into, that are asymptomatic and don't even know that they have uh, peripheral artery disease, believe it or not. And I should point out that all these statistics are updated in circulation by Goan colleagues from uh, 2014. So what is uh, peripheral artery disease? Just in, in, uh, when we get into the uh, field of um, research in clinical exercise physiology, I always like to say become a mini expert in your disease of choice. Really understand it, all, the entire, not only the physiology of it, but the pathophysiology, and that'll help you to determine if you have a biologically plausible mechanism for the treatment and management of the disease. So peripheral artery disease, it is a manifestation of generalized atherosclerosis. For the most part, it's the same risk factors uh, as uh, individuals um, would have that are going to develop coronary heart disease or cerebral vascular disease. Once again, it affects about 8 to 12 million individuals. And uh, we can see that 20% of them are over the age of 70. Now, these risk factors, number one is being age, okay, after uh, per decade of life, uh, starting at the age of 40, your risk for developing peripheral artery disease increases. Next on the list would be smoking. Smoking is the number two risk factor for peripheral artery disease. Three would be diabetes, four would be hypertension, and five would be dyslipidemia or high uh, lipid levels in the blood. So. How, what is the presentation of this disease? Well, we could have a blockage in an artery, and this is from the aorta down. Uh, common sites where we see blockages that lead to uh, peripheral artery disease or the signs and symptoms of the disease would be the common iliac and the superficial femoral artery. Now, if we have a blockage in any of those arteries, any skeletal muscle distal 
um, to the blockage would be subject to inadequate blood supply and therefore oxygen. Now to give you an understanding of what some of these individuals are dealing with, uh, we could say that um, our patient who has a blockage in the superficial femoral artery um, is going to go out for a walk. And as we, as he begins walking, he has an increase in oxygen demand to promote ATP uh, generation to allow, that allows his muscles to contract properly. Now, as they continue to go, there's a further mismatch between oxygen supply and demand, and we have a switch into anaerobic metabolism. Um, we know from, um, say, if you've had an exercise physiology class, one of the byproducts of anaerobic metabolism is lactic acid, and we buffer it and we form hydrogen ion that is definitely going to impair the contractile apparatus of the skeletal muscle. Now, as a result, this individual may get a pulling or tightness or a cramping feeling, and that's the classic signs and symptoms of symptomatic peripheral artery disease referred to as claudication. Now, what happens is this cramping or pain becomes so severe that they can't walk. It alters their biomechanics. They have to sit down and rest, and eventually the pain uh, will dissipate. It could take anywhere from two, maybe five, upwards to ten minutes, and they can continue on their walk. Uh, this is why peripheral artery disease is often referred to as a window shopper's disease. Now, if you know anybody that has this disease, um, or you can imagine having it, you would have a poor quality of life. Uh, you would have a very low functional capacity. Uh, generally, you would see um, the oxygen consumption values of between 10 and 15 milliliters of oxygen per kilogram of body weight per minute if tested on a graded exercise test. And we know that that's going to be a major risk factor for mortality. Uh, these individuals will have a four- to five-fold increased risk for heart disease, uh, having a heart attack, or uh, have a pretty good odds of eventually getting their uh, foot amputated because of uh, chronic ischemia and inadequate tissue oxygenation. Now when I look at the underlying causes of peripheral artery disease, inflammation is key. And if, uh, if you follow any uh, type of uh, pathophysiology, um, inflammation is a key contributor to the development of obesity. Uh, it's a key develop, uh, to the development of uh, diabetes and metabolic disorders and the generation of atherosclerosis, including peripheral artery disease. And how does it do this? Well, it can affect your ability for your blood vessels to dilate. If you cannot dilate your blood vessels, you're going to have a tough time uh, supplying blood and oxygen to the working skeletal muscle when they have an increase in uh, blood and oxygen demand. That's referred to as endothelial dysfunction. And then on the other side, um, individuals with peripheral artery disease have, uh, even if they have, we put a stent in to help restore blood flow, and they're able to have uh, normal delivery of uh, oxygen to the working skeletal muscle. Over time, if they've had chronic ischemia, they are going to have diminished um, capacity of the or diminished oxidative capacity, particularly their electron transport chain, and will have a low enzymatic activity. So we're going to see inadequate ATP generation because the enzymes of the mitochondria are going to be so diminished or suppressed, irregardless is if we were able to restore oxygen, say, 10 years after the fact that they were first diagnosed with peripheral artery disease. So it's not only an oxygen supply problem, it is an oxygen utilization problem as well, and it, at the forefront of this is inflammation and oxidative stress. So how do we treat it? Looking at it in terms of um, cardiovascular disease, uh, exercise and nutrition are going to be very important, not only in the prevention, but the management of these diseases. So the first, or the two things that we always focus on in clinical exercise physiology is risk reduction. So decreasing the risk for developing a secondary cardiovascular event such as a heart attack or stroke. 
The second one would be improving walking capacity. Now, if we look at the cardiovascular risk reduction, these guidelines were published by Alan Hirsch, uh, MD, uh, published in circulation in 2006, and they haven't been updated yet. So in the near future, I would imagine that these will be updated. Um, well, we are going to first uh, rely on uh, Western medicine and pharmacological approaches, uh, the health control uh, lipids in the blood, primarily the low-density lipoprotein or bad cholesterol. Uh, this is done by a statin drug. It's basically given out by can like candy now by uh, uh, practicing physicians to help lower um, lipid levels, uh, lower blood pressure. Uh, beta blockers and ACE inhibitors are common medications used for the treatment of cardiovascular diseases, um, even uh, peripheral artery disease. Uh, antiplatelets are antithrombotic medications, primarily the use of uh, baby aspirin. Um, and Plavix is another common drug given out. Diabetes control, if these individuals have diabetes, like the 10, about 20% of uh, people with peripheral artery disease have concurrent diabetes. Uh, they're going to have strict glycemic control mechanisms with exercise and diet and medications if needed, such as uh, metformin, uh, to help keep hemoglobin A1C under about 7 if possible. And then smoking cessation, uh, Chantix is a common drug that's given. Uh, that's very, very hard, and in my uh, experience working with individuals in an exercise rehabilitation setting. Um, it is very hard to get individuals to stop smoking. Then we have uh, exercise training. I always tell clients that I've worked with or even students in the classroom that um, exercise is, is medicine. It has me uh, pleiotropic and uh, cardioprotective effects such as um, we have antithrombotic effects, decreases your ability to form a clot. Um, it de uh, has antiarrhythmic effects. Uh, it has anti-ischemic effects, um, and these are going to be very, very important in reducing cardiovascular risk. We also say that exercise is like your poly pill. It's like taking your statin drug. It's like taking your ACE inhibitor. It's like taking your uh, metformin for glucose control. Um, it's like you're taking your baby aspirin and putting it into one magical pill to take it. It exercises a polypill. It can lower your cardiovascular disease risk factors, just like pharmacological intervention would. Now, I'm not saying to stop taking these medications by any means if you're doing, if you're on them, but give exercise a shot too. We've had several patients uh, that have gotten off, uh, we'll say, their blood pressure medications or cut their metformin in half, okay? It is a very strong stimulus to help lower your cardiovascular disease risk factors. Now, if we look at nutritional, um, from a nutritional vantage point, supplements and dietary patterns, what is the way to go about this? Is there any supplement out there that's going to reduce my risk for disease? And my best, uh, to the best of my knowledge on this currently, there is no scientific evidence that would suggest that taking a supplement is going to reduce your risk for cardiovascular disease. However, if you look at dietary patterns, say following a Mediterranean or a DASH diet, also referred to as dietary approaches to stop hypertension, um, these are uh, highly associated with increased longevity and reduced incidence of cardiovascular disease, and it's primarily through the role of lowering your cardiovascular disease risk factors as discussed above. Now, lastly, we mentioned that in, in uh, conjunction with lowering cardiovascular disease risk, uh, exercise training is a potent way to improve walking capacity. So treadmill exercise or walking exercise that is considered moderate intensity, about three to six METs, you will see a reduction or an improvement in walking capacity about 50 to 200 percent. That is superior to pharmacological um, interventions such as we call it salazazole or pentoxifiline that can only show about a 30 to 50 percent uh, improvement in walking capacity. And exercise is superior at proving walking capacity than if, I were, if a vascular surgeon was to go in and put a stent in the area of uh, arterial stenosis to restore blood flow. Exercise training is superior to each of these.
Now, if you look at it nutritionally, uh, unfortunately, supplements, once again, have kind of failed at improving walking capacity. There have been clinical trials that looked at L-arginine that is supposed to improve um, endothelial dysfunction. Uh, that is uh, yet to show any positive benefits. There's another one out on the uh, market that uh, can be marketed as a supplement is propanol L-carnitine that helps uh, particularly your Krebs cycle function uh, metabolically, and that one is in a latest meta-analysis has actually shown to improve uh, walking capacity, albeit uh, you have to be careful in interpreting that meta-analysis because of the sample sizes in the studies are very small. And lastly, vitamin E, a, a potent antioxidant that's supposed to help lower oxidative stress and inflammation, has yet to show any uh, positive benefits in improving walking capacity in those suffering from claudication. And we mentioned uh, the treatment, uh, exercise treatment to improve walking capacity in patients with peripheral artery disease. The CLEVER study was a multi-site study that looked at the six months of exercise intervention compared to optimal medical therapy uh, that uh, these individuals were taking philosophy or those that uh, had a stent put in. And you can see here that exercise was superior um, to comparing or improving um, optical medical therapy um, at a p-value of uh, 0.001, so a very strong improvement. They increased their walking capacity by 4.6 minutes compared to those taking optimal medical therapy. Those who got the stent put in, same thing, uh, was significantly better than optimal, optical medical therapy, but it was only a 2.5-minute difference compared which is much less compared to the exercise versus optimal medical therapy. And lastly, exercise training uh, was significantly better than stenting uh, to improve walking capacity by 2.1 minutes more compared to the individuals that were put in the stenting group. So this really does show, uh, this was the second study that has documented that exercise training in the form of modern intensity walking uh, is the superior mode of rehabilitation to improve walking capacity in those with peripheral artery disease. Now, if you think about it from another vantage point, is putting a stent in going to lower your cardiovascular disease risk factors as well? I would say most, most of the time, no, that will not be the case. Although that wasn't really tested in the study, uh, it would show the fact that I would um, think that exercise training would help in that uh, therapeutic mode as well. So based off this information, um, we know that exercise training possesses class one level evidence A recommendations by the American Heart Association for the treatment of claudication to improve walking distance. However, there is a caveat with this, um, it causes pain. Remember the signs and symptoms of peripheral artery disease is claudication, so when they're walking, they are going to experience exercise-induced leg pain. Now, as a result, you will see a decrease in adherence to exercise rehabilitation programs such as you would find in cardiac rehabilitation. And that is where the problem exists in exercise in the treatment of peripheral artery disease. The other one, does it, does it affect inflammation? This uh, chronic, chronic ischemia leads to an uh, inflammatory effect, and if we're following along earlier, inflammation is leading to uh, progression of atherosclerosis. So is it plausible that exercise can increase uh, inflammation that could exacerbate endothelial and mitochondrial dysfunction and uh, promote um, progression of atherosclerosis? Uh, that was a belief prior to uh, in the late 90s, and that's also a, a area of uh, investigation. Now, because exercise training um, in the form of walking does in, cause exercise-induced leg pain, um, we were uh, researchers in the, um, we'll say, in the early 2000s from the University of Sheffield in um, England looked at ulterior modes of exercise training that did not induce ischemia. So they paired lower body ergometry, so cycling exercise, that can in, uh, increase walking capacity, albeit not as much as treadmill training in head-to-head uh, -head trials, but 
they compared it to upper body ergometry, also known as arm cycling. And I remember the first time reading this, I'm like, well, based off my everything I know about the principles of uh, specificity, this uh, mode of rehabilitation seems crazy. How can arm cycling improve walking capacity in these individuals? Well, these uh, Walker and Swierska in 2000, 2005 looked at this directly, and they found that uh, upper body ergometry and lower extremity uh, cycling improve both maximal walking distance, so the amount of, or the how, how far these individuals could walk um, before uh, having to sit down and rest because the leg pain became too severe. The other one is pain-free walking distance. So how long could these individuals walk before uh, they had any uh, signs and symptoms of pain? Now, both the UBE and LBE groups significantly improved pain-free and maximal walking distance compared to baseline, but there was no significant differences between groups. So that's a good thing. We may have an ulterior mode of exercise that can improve walking distance, potentially lower cardiovascular disease risk factors without causing leg pain that could increase um, adherence to rehabilitation. Now later, uh, in a study that I uh, helped out on um, in 2009, we compared upper body ergometry to maximal uh, to treadmill training, and once again, similar to the findings by Zwierska and Walker, we improve we saw improved pain free and maximal walking distance in both groups, with no significant differences between groups. Now, the next question we have to ask ourselves: Well, upper body exercise training is the number one treatment for symptomatic peripheral artery disease we may have an ulterior mode to uh, improve walking capacity without inducing uh, claudication, but is, is the actual exercise anti-inflammatory? Now, why would I care about inflammation in this patient population? Well, uh, it's associated with, uh, inflammation is associated with disease progression and severity or the narrowing of the artery by increasing the size of the atherosclerotic plaque. It is associated with the prediction of cardiovascular events, meaning that those that have higher biomarkers of inflammation measured in plasma will have an increased risk for heart attack and stroke, which we don't want to see. And those with the highest markers of inflammation will have the lowest functional capacity. Okay, so giving credence to why study inflammation in this population. Now, if you pick up any, uh, say you typed in the PubMed, anti-inflammatory effective exercise. These are some things that'll pop up. Uh, is anti-inflammatory effective regular exercise responsible for reduced cardiovascular disease? And some of the biologically mecha uh, biological mechanisms by which we can suppress inflammation with chronic aerobic intensity uh, or moderate intensity aerobic exercise training. And in several populations, it's very prevalent to see this in patients with heart failure, diabetes, and obesity, particularly if there is a weight loss effect with exercise. So um, if I could see a reduction in inflammation um, following exercise in patients with peripheral artery disease, you know, I could decrease the risk for potential for uh, secondary uh, events such as myocardial infarction or um, stroke that could increase mortality. Okay, so what do we know? Okay, kind of moving on. We know peripheral artery disease is an inflammatory disease that in decreases quality of life, increases the risk for cardiovascular related morbidities and mortality, and affects walking ability. We know inflammation is a key mediator in the pathophysiology via increasing the size of the atherosclerotic plaque that's building up in the uh, lower extremity artery. It increases endothelial dysfunction and mitochondrial dysfunction that directly contribute to the decrease in walking capacity in these patients. Um, and it's, an asso it's highly associated with increase in morbidity and mortality. Now our exercise is a primary treatment. The goals to improve walking capacity and decrease uh, risk for heart attack or stroke. Is it tolerable? Uh, treadmill? And, you know, somebody with peripheral artery disease will say it is terrible type of training. It it hurts, but it works. Um, but how about upper body ergometry? The smaller studies to date have shown that, yeah, there may be a 
uh, a new mode of exercise that will be coming into cardiac rehabilitation centers for the treatment of peripheral artery disease that isn't going to hurt. Now, is exercise going to reduce inflammation, and why is that important? I think we've gone over that quite a bit. Now, does the non-ischemic exercise uh, reduce inflammation to a greater extent than ischemic-inducing treadmill training, the gold standard? That's one of the questions we have to ask ourselves as well. Now, what have we done? Um, we've actually tested this. Uh, this was part of my dissertation. I still uh, keep collaborations with the EXERT study in looking at exercise training to reduce claudication. This is the research side of things, um, the research scientists in clinical exercise physiology. That's basically everything we just went through, that whole process. Now, what have we been looking to do? We have asked ourselves, based off of this uh, $2 million study uh, funded by the National Institutes of Health, uh, it was a five-year trial, and looked at is upper body ergometry training an adequate mode of rehabilitation to increase walking capacity in patients with symptomatic peripheral artery disease? Does the uh, upper body ergometry and treadmill training alleviate inflammation? Why is that important? Um, we know the roles of inflammation in exacerbating atherosclerosis and increasing risk for cardiovascular-related morbidities and mortalities. Then what is the primary like, uh, physiological mechanism driving the improvement in walking capacity in this cohort? Is, uh, say, the individuals that are on the treadmill and for 12 weeks and are exercising and improve, say, walking capacity by 50%, is that what caused the improvement? Was it an improved uh, pumping capacity of the heart? Was it an improvement in capillary density? Was it an improvement in mitochondrial density? Was it a decrease in uh, inflammation and oxidative stress that was mediating these improvements? These are things that we're testing. So keep an eye out in uh, vascular medicine. That's where we're publishing um, in the near future that looks at that is, um, we'll say it's going to be probably out in the next six months to a year, uh, so I can't get into any details of what we found because the results haven't been published yet. So um, that is just basically an insight into the world of research scientists in clinical exercise physiology. Once again, uh, in 2016, this is going to be uh, number six on the number of jobs uh, that were published in the U.S. Uh, Bureau of Labor Statistics. Now, the one thing I'd always want to tell people who are looking at a field in, say, research, be ready to read and write. You're going to become a mini expert into the field. Um, this is uh, one article that um, I just uh, got published, uh, we'll say, two months ago, um, looking at inflammation and immun the immune system contributions to the etiology of atherosclerosis. So, I always challenge uh, my students in exercise science not only to be the mini expert, but understand the physiological machine that uh, we are as humans. How do things link together? How does inflammation in the immune system, how does that uh, contribute to uh, atherogenesis? How can exercise uh, be an anti-inflammatory mechanism to get, uh, provide uh, cardioprotective effects that we just went through uh, on the previous slides? So if you're looking at a field um, in uh, research, just be ready to read and write. It's a very rewarding, um, I think, field within the uh, exercise science community. Now, why Concordia St. Paul Exercise Science? Are you going to be exposed to some of this uh, research? And I definitely think uh, that is indeed the case. We have professors that um, we have some that are full-time professors that are actively researching at the institution, uh, and we have adjuncts that are actually still doing field work, um, so that are working as strength and conditioning coaches or uh, biomechanics um, or clinical exercise physiologists. And then there are some like myself that are active researchers and um, clinical exercise physiologists working in the field. So the goals of our program, what are they? Uh, we're going to demonstrate advanced knowledge of exercise principles, looking at strength and conditioning concepts, and nutritional influences on the body's physiological adaptations to exercise. 
You'll get a hand in the various research methodologies through research methods class and how they apply to the exercise science industry, and I think you got a pretty good taste of that in the last half hour. Um, you'll gain the necessary skills to conduct safe exercise testing, such as graded exercise testing and electrocardiography, and use this information to create uh, exercise prescriptions for diverse populations, focusing on health, disease prevention, and chronic disease management based off of ACSM guidelines. You'd be all ready to take the ACSM tests, such as a uh, um, clinical exercise specialist and be ready to work in cardiac rehabilitation. Um, Let's see, other ones, uh, you can evaluate factors influencing physical activity, so this could be physiological, psychosocial uh, aspects, and how these are important in the health maintenance and prevention of chronic conditions. Um, other one on here is, I think is, uh, you'll also get a hand in, is being prepared for employment opportunities in the field of exercise science in a public, private, and corporate settings. Uh, this is going to, you'll get a good hand in terms of biomechanics, the physiology and biochemistry of exercise, uh, immunology to some degree, and then um, the biomechanics, motor learning, and psychology. So you get a uh, very broad um, understanding, particularly in the Bachelor's of Arts program, that's going to help prepare you from all vantage points of exercise science to make yourself marketable. Now, to get a kind of look at some of the credit loads, um, the Master of Science curriculum is 33 to 36 credits, while the Bachelor of Arts is 128 credits. Within that is 49 major credits. And you can see some of the major courses um, that would be offered here. I think some of the highlights, particularly the Master of Science degree, um, is the clinical exercise assessment, exercise prescription, and uh, exercise physiology. Uh, really relating to the concepts of exercise and nutrition being medicine um, and really curtailing to ACSM's vantage point that is gov the governing body of uh, exercise science and exercise physiology to help prepare you for a career in exercise rehabilitation. Then you have the research methods class uh, that's going to be very important in particularly students um, generating an idea, a research topic that can help potentially change current exercise um, expert opinion in the field um, and potentially spur you on into an uh, advanced career in research if that's something that you like to do. Now, what are some of our current projects that you can see here? Uh, very broad, but you can see a lot of the students are really pertaining or kind of um, following that ACSM's uh, model uh, that the first one here is looking at the effects of aerobic and resistance training on quality of life in patients with fibromyalgia. Another student says looking at the effects of resistance training on inflammation, muscle strength, and quality of life in breast cancer survivors and patients with lymphedema. Um, another one is exercise training on uh, particularly uh, heart rate control training at 83% of age predicted max heart rate on weight loss in postmenopausal women. And then the effects of uh, anti-inflammatory uh, modalities such as naproxen or ice, ice therapy or in combination on biomarkers of inflammation uh, and pain ratings in collegiate athletes. So looking uh, at a different population here. Uh, and then the psychological benefits of exercise. The next one is looking at the effects of exercise training on uh, ADHD and anxiety in adolescents age 10 to 16 in a secondary educational setting. Um, so I think some of the take home points that you can see is some of our graduate students, uh, they're really able to own in on their area of interest, become a mini expert in the field, and potentially use this research to help find them the job of their choice working with a specific cohort population. Now, the one thing you know, students will tell you, and my wife would actually, uh, she's a master, um, master of Arts student at uh, Concordia right now, um, totally different field, but uh, she got her undergraduate degree at uh, Southwest Minnesota State, but before that she was at Inver Hills Community College and University of Minnesota Duluth, and I would say 95% of her credits transferred. And that was great for her when she was finishing up with her bachelor's degree um, 
at Concordia and then um, now is uh, went into the master uh, MA programs. Um, they have a great deal of partnership with the community colleges in the area, and that's partially due to the um, seamless credit transfer. And then it's an accelerated program. Uh, students with an MS will tell you that uh, they will be done um, in 24 months or less, uh, six semesters as we have them broken up into. Two credits a semester and their uh, sixth semester is the capstone or thesis project that will be prevent, uh, presenting uh, their major research project, some of those we just went through. Um, it is, for the non-traditional students, it's fully online. Okay, you meet once a week with the professor, seven-week courses, um, and it's an accelerated learning environment. Uh, it's set up where you're going to be uh, following along with online lectures, uh, doing following along with uh, online videos provided by the professor that are going to be uh, um, detrimental to your success, and then communicating your uh, students with critical thinking via, we call them discussion board topics, and uh, it ensures that we're going to curtail to all learning styles for uh, the students, whether if they're going to be a read, uh, reader type of learner by reading research articles and textbooks, more of uh, through uh, the kind of the traditional setting of a uh, recorded PowerPoint to see how things work, or videos. Uh, there's a, each way, shape, and form to help uh, curtail the class to individual learning styles. Okay, so some of the program outcomes uh, outside of being a mini expert in the field, we want you to be an effective communicator, accountable decision maker, uh, resourceful leader, effective informationist, uh, prevention practitioner I'd like to put in there because uh, looking at the vantage point of exercise medicine. And then within all of our courses, we really strive in terms of the critical thinking and in terms of being a continuous lifelong learner, and that's what we as faculty members uh, really strive in ourselves and like to portray to our students is if you're going to be working with patients out there in the field, you owe them to keep a uh, open mind and a high kind of desire to learn throughout your lifespan to help them with their uh, nutritional and exercise goals. Um, lastly, what else uh, I'd like to highlight here with uh, Concordia St. Paul is the student support services, particularly for the non-TRAD non students, they find a lot of help in academic advisors, uh, not necessarily just the faculty advisors, academic advisors to help with any major problems in registering and keeping them on task within the curriculum and then the faculty support in uh, their courses as well as in the um, research process. Uh, online tutoring, several students will use that as well if they need any type of access help, uh, particularly if uh, they feel weak in one area of uh, one area of study, there's always online tutoring available to help ensure that all students are going to not only succeed, but gain the necessary information to be not only competent, but excel within the field. Um, counseling services and career services for job placement, um, these are some of the things uh, that I think help make Concordia St. Paul a very uh, viable and excellent um, online learning institute to help students be prepared for the individual courses, but when they graduate, to be in the best position um, possible when entering the field. Now our faculty expectations, um, we want to create an open and safe learning environment. Um, we generally don't have a major problem with that. Students are very good interacting with others, show a lot of respect to their um, um, compadres within the class, um, so uh, it makes my job easy as a faculty member, um, not having to worry about that too much. Uh, the faculty also, we're going to be prepared for facilitating the learning process, and it's going to be different across each course and the, and the uh, students within the course. You kind of get in a field after that first day, um, how uh, the best learning process is going to be for the students. Is it going to be me lecturing or is it going to be more group discussion? Depend it also depends on the topic at hand. Um, let's see for time here. Uh, we'll get into the student expectations. 
Uh, it's going to be basically the same as any other institute that you've made or um, been a part of. We expect professionalism, honesty, and integrity. You, we want respect for not only faculty members and their time, but your, uh, also all the other students. Um, be organized, be accountable. It's just going to make your collegiate experience uh, much more enjoyable and effective. Now here, uh, once again, this uh, PowerPoint will be present or posted on Concordia's website, um, and you can look at uh, www.csp.edu uh, backslash admission backslash uh, graduate um, to look at uh, the application processes if you want to get into the Master's of Science um, program, as well as the Bachelor of Arts program. Uh, you can see here what are what is required for admissions. Um, the same things as you'll find on the website or you can get from this PowerPoint as well. And as always, if you have any other questions, or uh, you can pro uh, contact um, our enrollment manager. Her contact information is here. Or you can look at our exercise science webpage on uh, our csp.edu site. Um, I'd like to take the time to thank you for listening, and hopefully I've helped shed some light on careers in exercise science and really in terms of uh, exercise being medicine and the role of a clinical exercise physiologist and a research specialist within exercise science, the number one uh, perceived to be growing job by 2018. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, um, Dr. Salisbury. We do have a question from uh, Joe Turner. His question is, yeah. I've been coaching for 13 years in various sports. What field of exercise science should I concentrate if I want to work on or work at the college or pro level? Okay, so college or pro level, um, it depends on your individual background. A lot of times uh, what they're going to look for is a minimum of a bachelor's degree in exercise science, preferably a master of science degree, um, and then a major certification in uh, they look more at the uh, National Strength and Conditioning Association. It's called a Certified Strength and Conditioning Specialist, a CSCS. So uh, most um, strength coaches at the collegiate or professional level will have a master's degree and then a CSCS certification and then maybe another certification uh, in Olympic lifting because that's the primary mode of exercise to increase peak power output. Great. Are there any other questions today? And I'd like to say if you guys uh, um, uh, have any other questions, you can just, uh, if you think of them after, you can go to Concordia's website. My information is on there. I'm Dr. Derek Salisbury. Feel free to shoot me an email. I'm always good at getting back to people that are curious about exercise science. and. Uh, our program, and I always just like to spread the word of exercise and nutrition for health performance or health and human performance. So, whatever I can do to help you guys too in uh, your fields, you know, I'll do my best. Well, we, we appreciate your time. We will be posting this webinar recording on the online.csp.edu website, and we will follow up with all attendees with an email that will link to this recording. So um, thank you so much for joining, and I hope you all have a great day.